the International Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018 will begin shortly. We kindly request all guests and participants to please proceed to the Makara Ballroom and take their respective seats. In accordance to the government regulation, we are required to inform you of the safety procedures of this Makara Ballroom. This morning safety induction will be given by Mr. Budi from the Double Tree Hotel. Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu. Selamat datang di Double Tree Bayer Jakarta. Terima kasih atas kedatangannya uh, dan pilihan Anda menggunakan hotel kami sebagai tempat uh, meeting pada hari ini. Uh, nama saya Budi dari Departemen Security. Mohon waktunya sebentar untuk menyampaikan informasi mengenai petunjuk keselamatan apabila terjadi situasi emergency. Uh, saat ini kita berada di Makara Borum, tepatnya di Ground Floor. Nah, di sini ada beberapa pintu exit, yang mana pintu exit ini mengarahkan Anda menuju ke SMP Point yang terletak di samping Makara Borum. Jadi dari sini Kemudian ke depan ke, ke lobi forum, kemudian ke kanan langsung ke titik kumpul atau SMP point. Uh, kemudian bila terjadi situasi emergensi, tentunya akan ada alarm yang akan berbunyi. Dimohon tetap tenang dan jangan panik karena kita mempunyai emergency respon tim yang akan menyelidiki mengenai penyebab terjadinya alarm tersebut. Kemudian bila diperlukan proses evakuasi. Tentunya akan ada notifikasi dari public speaker yang ada di ruang ini mengenai petunjuk ataupun langkah-langkah yang harus diambil dalam proses evakuasi. Di dalam proses evakuasi tentunya akan dibantu oleh tim kami sampai betul-betul menuju ke SMB Point. Uh, sebagai tambahan aja, untuk hari ini kita tidak ada schedule untuk fire drill, jadi Bapak Ibu bisa fokus mengikuti acara sampai dengan selesai. Kemudian untuk e, tambah juga pada saat break atau kondisi istirahat dimohon untuk memperhatikan barang-barang yang ada di ruangan demi kenyamanan kita bersama. Mungkin itu aja bisa saya sampaikan. Terima kasih atas perhatiannya dan selamat pagi. Ministry of Health, Republic of Indonesia, Honorable Vice Dean for Academy, Research and Student Affairs of Faculty of Engineering Universitas Indonesia, Honorable Keynote and Invited Speakers, Honorable Committee Members and Colleagues, Distinguished Guests and Participants. On behalf of the International Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018 Organizing Committee, I would like to welcome you to the ballroom of Double Key Hotel here in the heart of the capital city of Indonesia, Jakarta, for the opening ceremony of the East Bay 2018. This year's symposium will focus on empowering multidisciplinary partnership for healthcare product industry and services. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia as a country comprises of various ethnicities and diverse cultures. From the tip of the east to the tail of the west, Indonesia offers a variety of traditional heritage from dances, songs, and many more. To formally welcome you, we proudly present to you the students from the Faculty of Engineering Universitas Indonesia performing Asana Prabala Dance, a traditional dance from the infamous Island of the Gods, Bali. <coughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the General Chair of International Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018 Organizing Committee, Dr. Insignia Sotia Astuti Ningsi, to give her report. Indonesia, 
Honorable Dean of Faculty of Pharmacy or Representative Officer from Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Indonesia. Honorable keynote and invited speakers, distinguished guests and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and real pleasure for me to open the third International Symposium on Biomedical Engineering ISPE 2018. This symposium is dedicated to researchers, academicians, government policy makers, and industrial practitioners who have interest in science and technology development in the field of biomedical engineering. The work biomedical engineering itself is unquestionably a multidisciplinary term between two main fields, health sciences and engineering. A synergy collaboration between the faculties in Universitas Indonesia is highly appreciated and supported. Now, Universitas Indonesia supports many scientific conferences. At the best university in Indonesia, based on the KS World University ranking, Universitas Indonesia has published more than 13,000 papers in the last three years. In this year, Faculty of Engineering has started 450 publications indexed by Scopus. Especially in biomedical engineering, currently there have been various discoveries and research in biomedical engineering areas from higher education and research institutions. However, the result of lacking coordination that can be pinpointed to the specific directions in order to accommodate this idea, a symposium is needed primarily to conduct discussions for positive collaboration with all biomedical researchers equally and mutually. In this perspective, the theme of the this year's symposium, Empowering Multidisciplinary Partnership for Healthcare Product Industry and Services, is definitely very relevant. After successfully organizing the first and the second ISPE, we believe that the event would be benefit to the development of biomedical engineering research in a way that participants can share experiences, knowledge, and develop collaboration between institutions. We realize that the research process will take a long journey. Therefore, collaboration and cooperation of all parties is very meaningful for us. We hope that the outcome of the research will not only end as a publication, but also implemented and utilized by the society. In this occasion, I also would like to extend my single thanks to the Dean of Engineering Universitas Indonesia, the Res Initiative Research Center of Biomedical Engineering as the organizer of this symposium. I would like to express my appreciation to the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, the Faculty of Dentistry, and the Faculty of Pharmacy for their contribution and collaborations. Additionally, I extend a hearty thanks thank you to the members of the organizing committees for dedicating their valuable time to them so that we could enjoy the fruitful conference program over this couple of days. In concluding, I wish you all every success in this podium and very pleasant stay in Jakarta. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, on behalf of UI Rectors Professor Mohamed Anis, officially the third international symposium on biomedical engineering is open. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Siswanto MPH DTM, a head of Agency of Health Research and Development, Ministry of Health Republic of Indonesia, and the general chair of ISBE 2018 Organizing Committee, to join the vice dean of Faculty of Engineering Universitas Indonesia. For the sounding of the goal, as a sign that the International Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018 is officially open. We also invite the director of Research Center for Biomedical Engineering, Professor Misri Gozan.
We would like to invite our keynote and invited speakers to please join the photo session for the opening ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, representing the Minister of Health, Republic of Indonesia, please welcome Dr. Sis Wantun, MPHDTM, Head of Agency of Health Research and Development, Ministry of Health, Republic of Indonesia, to deliver a special speech for the International Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018. Dr. Sis Wantun was born in Tulung Agung, was a graduate from the Faculty of Medicine at Langa University. He was awarded his master's degree in public health from the, new, from the University of New South Wales, Australia, and another master's degree in administration and health policy from the University of Nagasaki, Japan. Before setting up office as the head of Agency of Health Research and Development, he was the head of the Center for Applied Health Technology and Clinical Epidemiology, in 2011, and the head of the Center of, for Development of Nutrition and Food in 2010. His latest achievement was Satya Lantana Karya for his 20 years of dedication to the nation. Dr. Siswanto, the stage is yours. Uh, distinguished uh, Vice Dean, Faculty of Engineering, University of Indonesia, and the representative from Faculty of Pharmacy, Faculty of Medicine, also Faculty of Dentistry, the Chair of Biomedical Engineering Research Center, uh, speakers, and all participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning. Praise uh, to God Almighty. Today, we can gather here to attend the 2018 International Symposium on Biomedical Engineering. Uh, I appreciate, on behalf of the Ministry of Health, that the symposium has taken the theme empowering the multidisciplinary partnership for healthcare products and services. And I think the words partnership, synergy, collaboration, and integration, and the like, now is becoming the important words to enhancing recent activity to be more effective and efficient. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, based on the burden of disease study, Indonesia now is facing what we call with epidemiological transition. Indonesia is facing triple burden of disease and double burden of nutrition problem. Measure by with daily loss, disability, life loss. The burden is shifted from communicable disease to non-communicable disease. However, we are still facing the home of endemic communicable disease like malaria, 
dengue, tuberculosis, and influenza. In fact, we have still the problem of neglected tropical disease like filariasis, leprosis in some area in eastern part of Indonesia, schistosomiasis in central Sulawesi. On the other hand, we are also facing new emerging diseases like bird flu, H5N1, and then Ebola, and then Max Coffee, and so on. In nutrition, we have double burden problem. In one hand, we have the problem of undernutrition. We have the problem of underweight, stunting, and wasting. But on the other hand, we have the problem of obesity. Based on the 2013 Basical Sufi or Risk Estas, the prevalence of under 5 stunting is 37.2%. It means that 4 out of 10 under 5 is suffering stunting. And then the prevalence of obesity in adults, it's more than 18 years, is 26.3%. It means that 1 out of 4 adults is obese, like me. <laughs> so, as we all know, obesity is a risk factor for degenerative diseases. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would say that innovation in health is somewhat different with the innovation in other fields. The development of health products like medicine, vaccine, medical device, as well as biomedical engineering products like monoclonal antibody, biosimilar stem cell, should meet not only the scientific principle, but also the principle of human ethics. It is an important point. In fact, if the products are aimed to be produced, distributed, and marketed in the community, all phases of the development should comply with the requirement of regulatory agency, that is Indonesian MTA or Badan POM for medicine and vaccine, and then Indonesian pharmaceutical and medical device Central general, Christian Pharmacus for medical device. Also, it should be understood that those who apply for marketing approval is not a recent entity under the university, but such an application should be done by industry. My point here, the partnership, the synergy, and the collaboration between researcher, academician, business, government, and community is crucial for developing health product that can be marketed. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, within the last three decades, we have entered what we call with the OMIC era. Within the OMIC perspective, the prevention and the poor of disease can be addressed at molecular level especially genomic cascade. Therefore, there has been born a new approach in medical science like personalized medicine or precision medicine, functional medicine, pharmacogenomic, nutrigenomic, nutrigenetic, cellular therapy, in fact, gene editing. In addressing the problem of generative disease, there are big opportunities in biomolecular science as well as in biomedical engineering to create innovation covering the level, the five level of intervention like health promotion, specific protection, early diagnosis, and prompt treatment, disability, limitation, and palliative care. Just to mention, for promotion and how to develop model of community-based prevention, for specific protection, the development of new vaccine, for early diagnosis, the development of diagnosis kit that can be used at the level of POC point of care, and for curative the development of more effective and safe medicine. For palliative care, how to provide a more holistic care for improving the quality of life of end stage patients. With the abundance of natural resources, many researchers from university and research institutes, if there is a synergy and collaboration, I do believe that we are able to develop new medicine, new vaccine, phytomedicine, traditional medicine, functional food, food supplement, as well as medical device. With the approach of biomolecular engineering, a more advanced therapeutic modality can be established, as well as like uh, biosimilar, monoclonal antibody, stem cell therapy, and so on. To conduct research and development, to produce health product that can be marketed again, there is a mass, the synergy between many stakeholders. So, ABGC, academician, 
business, government, and community. I hope this international symposium can share the experience, can share this best practice, as well as share ex expertise on how to do research and development for innovative products that can be implemented in health service. The function of the government is to provide stewardship and facilitation. Just to remind, the activity of research are not only for publication, but most importantly is for improving health development to be more effective and more efficient. For foreign participants, welcome to Indonesia, welcome to Jakarta. Now Jakarta is very helpful as to host the 18 Asian Games. So enjoy your stay in Jakarta. Maybe uh, please extend your stay in Indonesia and you all can enjoy some interesting tourist destinations in Indonesia like Borobudur, Bali, Batu Kutu Lombok. Because now it's been an earthquake. <laughs> so have a fruitful symposium. Thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to invite Professor Mr. Goza, the Director of Research Center for Biomedical Engineering Universitas Indonesia, to present a special token of appreciation to Dr. Siswanto. National Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018. We will now take a short 15 minutes coffee break and we would like to invite all of you to enjoy the coffee break served just outside of the ballroom. After coffee break, we will have plenary session one and session two and we can request all guests and participants to return to the Mahara ballroom for this plenary session in 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we also provide the schedule for today's parallel session outside of this portal, just beside the poster session. So, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your coffee break and we will see you again in 15 minutes.
Rosa, the session is now yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi semuanya. Uh, it's my honor to to have you all here, the distinguished speakers, and also the attendees, uh, speakers of this uh, symposium. Uh, we have had a nice weather today. Uh, I hope you all you enjoy uh, the conditions and the situation around Jakarta here nowadays. Maybe those who just arrived in Jakarta in this one or two days has already seen some uh, decorations around the city. So, I would like today uh, to invite uh, the distinguished uh, speakers, Dr. Claudia Gardner, into the platform, to the platform and also Professor uh, Riska. Um, oh. Okay, first I would like to uh, introduce the a forum to uh, Dr. Claudia Gardner. She was graduated from a PhD from University of Düsseldorf, Germany, uh, in biochemistry. And she uh, established a microchip company in 2002. Uh, yes, she has some uh, very interesting or very deep uh, experience in the microtechnology uh, micro area because she was involved in the newly founded application center for microtechnology in Vienna, Germany, uh, from the university that we know in Indonesia. That Vienna is very famous with the optical technology. Uh, she built the technological infrastructure for the realization of miniaturized system and I said and established the uh, lab on chip technology as a recent, uh, her recent area uh, before finally she founded the company Micro Fluidic Chip Shop in 2002. Uh, I, I do not want to, to read all this very long introduction here, but I just want to emphasize here that she, uh, Dr. Claudia Gardner uh, was decorated with the Emily Rubling Prize in 2014, as well as with the third prize as European Women Innovator uh, last year. So, practically she has been leading the wide variety of recent projects for the development of lab one chip system for the life science applications and respective novel fabrication technologies. Today, she would like to uh, deliver the coping with the challenging demand of the detection of biological pathogens, uh, different biological components have to be detected, and the application scenarios as well as the technical, technical implementation for, uh, for example, tuberculosis and HIV, and the way towards challenging detection tasks like currently the Zika virus that will be shown in her presentation. So please. Okay, thanks, Miss. It was this wonderful introduction. And yeah, hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure being here in Indonesia and presenting you our work somewhere between engineering, medical technology, medicine, and biology. And um, yeah, uh, the title of my talk is to present a flexible diagnostic platform enabling to really cope with a very biological task identification task. Um, yeah, first of all, I will give you an outline of who we are, Shipshop as company, 
than microfluidics, uh, what this interesting word means, uh, and a project goal, and how we implement uh, a task finally into a novel product. Yeah, we are a medium-sized company uh, founded in 2002. That means, meanwhile, 16 years in business in the microfluidics world with 90 people and operating since 16 years. We are one of the large and old ones. Um, we have a dedicated infrastructure. Here you see two buildings of us. And um, uh, dedicated towards the volume fabrication of microfluidic devices, make it in heaven and plastic, but also coping with various uh, materials to integrate into our consumer devices. And finally, and that was important, what we also learned from the introductory speech. Uh, we need to operate according to regulatory requirements. That means from the beginning of our company history, we are certified according to ISO 9001 and even more important ISO 13485. That allows us to develop, fabricate and also commercialize medical devices. That's usually the difference between the uh, industry and the university to also have to look at regulatory aspects and also on fabrication tasks. Our mission, everybody needs to have the mission state, uh, statement. We would like to have the lab on a chip devices into daily laboratory life and we will be successful we will only if we can achieve this to reasonable prices. And that's one of the important things we have to cope with directly from the beginning that we design our system uh, according to manufacturing aspects uh, to allow a smooth upscale at affordable cost. That's something I would like to show you um, that, first of all, we have existing devices we can order off the shelf, we provide system and system means, a consumable, an instrument and also the biological assay and main part of our work is dedicated towards custom design and fabrication work. And that's, this slide is here presented because I would like to invite all of you who is interested in research. We are doing a lot of tolerantry research and since a lot of you come from universities and institutes, uh, if somebody is interested to join us in research projects, we are always interested in new collaboration and that makes it really nice. Uh, you see here uh, four European projects and also European projects are open for other parties ex yeah, not being necessarily situated in the European Commission. Now, coming to my topic, microfluidics, I always say microfluidics is present and future. What would I like to say with this? Um, everybody has microfluidics. Uh, blood vessels in your body, um, simply that's the beauty of microfluidics. And microfluidics is already a billion dollar business. All of this printer, inkjet printer heads are built from really marvelous microfluidics, but for us the most important thing are uh, obviously these nice microfluidic devices where you can really run uh, analytical assays. Yeah, what's to be gained? Nobody would do anything uh, just because it's a new technology. We would like to gain a, a, a better, better performance of something and to increase cost. Um, Miniaturization helps, physics on our, on our side. We analyze, uh, used to analyze things like uh, looking at proteins, what it took during my PhD a complete day. Meanwhile, we do the same task within a couple of minutes or even seconds. So from days to minutes, seconds, that's a time gain you cannot neglect. neglect, neglect. Then reduction of sample volumes. Um, you can reduce the sample volume within our microfluidic devices to increase the sensitivity. That means we can decrease the sample volume. That does not go beyond to virtually uh, a microliter volume usually because you have to need uh, to, to bring enough amount of sample target material in. Finally, we can have an increased data throughput, increased performance because we combine different analytical steps requiring normally in, an, uh, in a lab several instruments. And you can go to a portable system. That means at the point of care, at the point of need, the system can be operated. And that was also one of the topics from the introductory speech. So, 
Moving now to biology, biological samples are our main target because they are much more challenging than chemistry. With biological samples, you have more or less four building blocks you're looking at. You're looking at the cells where you apply uh, usually microscopy, staining technology. Um, you look at the genetic material that's the uh, most prominent uh, development over the past decades um, to really get sensitive. There you look at both material uh, from this genetic material list, the DNA and the RNA, um, and uh, in most cases you amplify the material to get um, utmost um, sensitive. Protein enzymes, that means immunology, serology, um, they you simply look at look at lock and key me mechanism to identify really specifically um, your target material. And finally, you also look at uh, um, metabolites, that means the field of clinical chemistry, usually rather quick assays, also rather cheap assays, what's the challenge for us, uh, simply compete with standard methods there what are not more than a piece of paper. The complete tech scene in the microfluidics world is having after this guy's with a tricoder presented as a 17th, um, that means roughly 40 years old. We consider we are not yet there, but finally we are moving toward this. We now have um, these integrated diagnostic platforms um, really serving a wide variety of needs. So that's the goal approaching to it now. Um, for the detection of biological tasks, we uh, need to cover two tasks. First of all, we need to detect that something is in. Usually then we have already broad feeling uh, what we are seeing. But finally, we would like to go deeper in, in the topic to identify really the species we have in our sample to really get to the right treatment finally. Um, then, uh, I'm now reporting about a special project goal where we wanted to uh, look at uh, two different levels of detection. First of all, to look at the molecular level, to be really sensitive, and then to confirm with the same test, with the same device, with the same working step, with an immunological assay, the result of the molecular assay. So that increases the reliability level. And um, another task, uh, was a permanent and one-time measurement system um, to simply look uh, when, uh, when you have one sample uh, that's a usual case in, in clinical diagnostic or where you are permanently looking at what might happening that's uh, for instance in uh, scenarios that you screen a metro station at an airport uh, or the environment in a hospital. So that means looking at different user scenarios and also how to focus in on some materials. Um, in the first instance, we, we started with a, a, a bundle of uh, bacteria um, and one virus. These are the typical bacteria used if you have a terroristic attack or also zoonotic diseases are included here. But that was a model panel uh, since one of our partners was interested in this. Um, sample uptake, uh, more or less from the uh, status, we have three different um, scenarios. We have air sampling, that means we need to gather air, transfer it in a liquid uh, status and, and move it on a chip. We can have a, a liquid sample, what's already uh, liquid and therefore easy to uh, handle. And then we can also have um, yeah, solid samples or swabbing takes care. Uh, then the steps on such a lab on a ship system, such a tiny device, are um, starting the filtering, then enrich the sample, and then in this case, we filter the sample and uh, undergo uh, to undergo two different analytical scenarios. The miniaturization. We benefit from physics. If this would not be the case, everything would not make sense. Um, the theory behind is simply the shorter the pathway, the faster the reaction can start. We will not make the reaction uh, uh, faster, we simply uh, let the molecules meet faster. Um, then the second thing we applied is the complete lab on a chip concept. That means that we can run an assay in a sample to answer fashion. And we have a lab-free approach that we virtually can uh, analyze at the point of interest 
and do not need to go to a central lab and do not need to have all the equipment uh, uh, being um, available in a lab. And the technical implementation where we have a complex biological task, we need to make little building block out of this to uh, really uh, solve any problem uh, sequentially. So we have a modular approach to cope with complex biological challenges. Um, now I will simply give an example how we address this, uh, showing for any single step of this uh, analytical process one option of implementation. Uh, for the sample collection, what is uh, the normal operation when we have a, a solid sample? Uh, in an environment, for instance, we have the swabbing over a surface. Um, when we uh, work uh, with something, some clinical samples, we quite often um, have a cervical scrub or a nasopharyngeal scrub, and then transferred in, in some kind of vessel which has a liquid reagent and can directly hook this on a chip. And what for, for some application, when you have to retain a sample for confirmation, we have here a contamination-free operation procedure that we can remove the sampling vessel for afterwards uh, reconfirmation. Second step would be a sample preparation step uh, that's also embedded on chip, typical sample preparation for molecular diagnostic is, for instance, a DNA extraction, First of all, um, clean up the DNA and concentrate the DNA. And we always made a comparison to the gold standard. Um, in this case, that's a, a small color, color from the Kai gene, and uh, we achieved to be comparable to this result in an integrated fashion. What was a good result? So the next step was the amplification of the target material. Amplification allows us to be really sensitive and. That's simply a comparison. We work with two different lab on a chip based solutions uh, on options to carry out a PCR and the conventional method. And what we achieved um, with the same conditions that we got uh, comparable results uh, quite quickly with one of our uh, lab on a chip approaches and with a conventional system. And, uh, the most interesting thing is obviously how sensitive do we get and uh, how fast can we achieve this. And uh, with the lab on a chip system, we uh, reduce the time for the PCR from 60 minutes to with one minute 10 minutes, with the other minute to 30 minutes. So that was an impressive time decrease, allowing really to um, cut down the uh, analysis time by the half already with this step. Then, Second detection approach uh, for the confirmation of the PCR result was the immunology. Um, and uh, the special uh, task was we would like to screen an environment over a longer period. That means we need to reuse the biological surface over a longer time uh, without disturbing the surface. That means we flush permanently a sample um, and still uh, when a positive event happens, the sample needs to be able to react with a biological surface on our detection device. Um, so that means um, we ran negative samples and after a while we also inserted a positive sample and here you see the study we made eight days so we said one week should be sufficient for, for the overall device to run. That means we made the series of experiments usually a bit longer and still could achieve um, when we insert a sample that we saw a positive result and that means, okay, biological surface can be used um, over a longer time. So that means we implemented now with the immunology and the PCR2 detection methods uh, as building blocks on the chip. And um, then obviously we need to come up with different solutions for a permanent measurement system and a one-time measurement system for a permanent measurement system here with a uh, several milliliter volumes, that's nothing yet you can store on a little microfluidic device. Microfluidic device that's yeah, small, this size, that you cannot store milliliters or even liters uh, when you run a, an assay over a week. Uh, but if you have a one-time analysis task, then everything should be stored on the chip. And, uh, yeah, finally, uh, 
the instrument was realized. Here you see French firefighters and German armed forces testing in our labs, and um, we ended up with a system that we used for further developments. Um, and there, slide picture show this guy here. Uh, for the challenge to us, um, the Gates Foundation is sponsoring a lot of work in the diagnostic scenario and there the task was, okay, a diagnosis system for HIV, tuberculosis and malaria and other, other diseases, affordable, reliable and uh, in low research settings. And we started an 80 month journey to provide a proof of concept. Um, as open diagnostic platform this immunoassay, molecular assay, clinical subchemistry and cell-based assays as a lab on a chip device. Yeah, the interesting panel here um, uh, provided uh, and we picked up um, four model assays uh, and um, also here you see a lot of, of these topics popping up that was already mentioned earlier. We came up with a family of three chips one assay for tuberculosis, one for HIV, P24, direct uh, virus detection, and the liver function test. Just to show you, we implemented also the assay on the chip, that means to de deal also with, with all this biological species. And a nice instrument came around this, and there you also can directly see that's a merger of biology and technology, that's more engineering and less biology and one fits all that um, Interesting for a lot of, of these viruses like Zika, Shikunguya, Dengue, it's an RNA virus that means looking at the DNA, that's an easy task. RNA makes everything two steps more complicated and from the handling procedure, that's a much more fragile um, device and also target. Yeah, that's a, a, a summary of the um, Chip Genie DX family, Chip Genie DX is our brand name for um, this platform here. We have um, systems for small metabolites, immunoassays, and molecular diagnostic that will be operated with one instrument. Okay, and this I would like to conclude. Um, you saw a flexible diagnostic platform that can cope with a wide variety of different biological tasks and all kinds of biological samples. Um, it's uh, designed in an open fashion that we can easily integrate for the further essays on this platform and we have equipped this as a research instrument allowing a lot of interoperability, a lot of features and also as can be realized as a low cost instrument really dedicated to the specific task where you do not need all the functions. And the ship family is at hand to test the system and finally that's for our partners the starting point for the development of our task. And with this I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any of your questions.
itself. So, but it's for some of some of, some of the forms that we, I would like to, to introduce. The professor Riska is a lecturer in the dental public health and preventive dentistry department, faculty of dentistry, uh, University of Indonesia. Her main interest is focusing on community research and preventive dentistry. She was born in West Sumatra. Uh, completed her bachelor degree from the Faculty of Dentistry in 1984 and was awarded a doctoral degree in Preventive Dentistry from Hokkaido University, Japan in 1996. Uh, Professor Liska is also blessed with excellent uh, managerial skills uh, and some leadership, team building and public, that's, uh, probably some uh, academic work such as uh, a comparison of health of school children between Jakarta and Hokkaido in 1992. And uh, she also developed the potential use of ERT technique in the management of dental careers in the School of Dental Service in Indonesia. Uh, she also an active speaker in some uh, national and international academic forums. She would like to deliver, uh, to introduce us the works with uh, Dr. Sangha together uh, to develop a product we call it as uh, Propolis Fluoride. So I would like to give the forum to Professor Riska. in school 
but this program is not uh, is is not success, and then uh, we have to think about the dental material for dental prevention, and then the other the other reason is because of dental caries treatment needs that are easy to apply and affordable, and uh, the children not afraid for the dental treatment. In the industrialist country like uh, Japan, Australia, Hong Kong, and Brazil, when we use about the silver diamine fluoride, silver silver diamine fluoride is uh, the taste is like metal and color. The color is in the tooth will give the brown color and then is uh, not aesthetic for the uh, dental caries in front of the teeth. And then uh, SDF, we call it SDF, silver diamine fluoride, is excellent antibacterial ability because of silver diamine is good for antibacterial but side effects such as uh, we call it causing black discoloration and metallic taste thus in Indonesia there is no silver, silver diamine fluoride and then we thought about how to change silver diamine fluoride to use to the Indonesian children One of the one of the herbal we call is propolis. This is a this is a good in a antibacterial agent, especially for the bacteria we call is Tractococcus mutans. That is the uh, the bacteria to uh, to the etiology of dental caries. And from Dr. Sahwan research, uh, result is propolis from Indonesia was proven to be safe for human application. Thus, the mechanism of propolis as an antibacterial agent is to interfere with bacterial cell membrane and cytoplasm and suppress DNA synthesis. The propolis in, in, in the industry uh, from last year we have uh, some several, uh, not several, I think a lot of uh, research uh, collaboration with uh, Dr. Sahan. This topical application of propolis extract gel can accelerate the wound healing process and enhance the proliferation of fibroblasts and accelerate the healing of ulcer. And then uh, the other is about propolis can inhibit Streptococcus mutans and lactobacilli grows as an etiology of dental caries. And propolis is used for cavity disease, disinfection. And the other is propolis is used for root canal sterilization. This is about the result of a recent collaboration from the uh, faculty of dentistry. This is, uh, we know Dr. Anki over there, me and Dr. Sahan. Uh, research about, uh, the first is about honey propolis heart candy. This is, uh, had uh, published. And then the other is about CPP, SCP, propolis chewing gum. Uh, the children can uh, taste the chewing gum. And then uh, the other is about propolis fluoride. Propolis fluoride families. We had a uh, topical application in about uh, uh, 500 students in around Jakarta and Depok. And then CPP SCP propolis gel is in vitro. And now ongoing research is CPP SCP will apply to the two children in kindergarten and primary school but the result I think uh, next year. The, the result is next year. And the other is about propolis motorensis. This ongoing 
and propolis toothpaste is ongoing. And then the objective of this study sought to establish whether the topical application of propolis fluoride inhibits the process of dental caries activity. The method is will approve uh, this research is approved by ethic committee from faculty of dentistry uh, last year and uh, the research is two divided the first is experimental study in vitro study uh, we, uh, we use total bacterial account and mineralization to survey use SAM and EDX and then uh, the other is uh, about the effect of uh, propolis fluoride in deciduous teeth in children. This is uh, this uh, one, uh, two of our research result is in 159 children, uh, 48, 60 months in West Jakarta, and then the others is in Panjaran Nasdemo. And then the sampling is uh, all intergarden student, and then uh, the we we total account of this is a decay missing filling, and then about the oral hygiene or plug index, and then we apply the propolis fluoride into surface uh, dental cavity. The operator is dentist, and before this performs, uh, they uh, we use the calibration first. And then uh, we uh, we compare with silver diamond fluoride, and then we uh, we examine from the evaluation in seven day, and then one month and three months because uh, silver diamond fluoride will retain in the dental cavity uh, until more than six months. After seven day and one and three uh, one month examination, we're done to evaluate caries cavity to be arrested. Arrested is the process of dental caries will stop. The result, this is uh, the result of a uh, uh, in vitro study, there is, uh, we found that the uh, yeah. propolis fluorides uh, compared to SDF, there is no significant. And then we can use uh, propolis fluoride to change uh, the silver diamond fluoride. This is, uh, we see by, uh, by propolis fluoride, there is no blackening, but with silver diamond fluoride, there is blackening. And then uh, this is uh, fluoride uh, in uh, propolis fluoride and SDF. There is no uh, significant difference. This, but the difference is the retain of uh, silver diamond fluoride in the cavity. There is about more than three months or six months, but. Uh, propolis fluoride only until three months. We have to apply it again. This is after use the propolis fluoride. The free uh, the uh, activity caries uh, decrease until 430 surface. This is uh, and we have the result that's uh, the. Propolis fluoride will longer retain in the dental cavity if the dental cavity is uh, clean, uh, then the and clean from the uh, debris. This is uh, the black score, and this is the significant association between regular tooth brushing habits. Uh, with the effect of propolis uh, fluoride. And then, uh, according to the in vitro study, no significant difference with uh, silver diamond fluoride, and the efficacy of propolis fluoride as an alternative for dental caries treatment is better in good oral hygiene. Conclusion is propolis fluoride has a big potential 
to be an alternative of silver diamond chloride. This is uh, our Uh, this is the video. Is video is about uh, the training of trainer to the doctor how to use the propyl fluoride apply in the dental cavity. Yeah. Uh, there is no sound. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the children. And then... This is the innovation about propolis fluoride. Uh, the, ne the dentists have known about the propolis fluoride. This is uh, easy to apply and the price is uh, cheap and uh, the dentist will give the propolis chloride to the this patient Flawless, flawless, and then uh, the first we use flawless, and then micro brass, and this is uh, propolis chloride. Called this flawless. This is micro brass to for uh, to apply the propolis fluoride in dental cavity. This cotton roll and then cotton pellet and then we put uh, three to the glass plastic glass and then with micro brass. We apply to the dental cavity. This, this is the dental cavity. Uh, the dental cavity only in dental caries or dentin because uh, we cannot put the propolis chloride in uh, pulp car caries, dental caries. We apply it like this, and then we wait for 30 minutes not to eat or drink. Is there any question from the floor? One, okay. 
Okay. Then would you like to, uh, please help this, this first? Professor Jerome. Thank you very much. Um, my question for Claudia um, regarding your um, assays. It looks like you're using, you're using mostly optical detection. Closer, closer. Yeah, sorry. Um, it looks like you're using mostly optical detection for your uh, assays. Um, and are you also using other transducers, other ways of detecting, uh, you know, bacteria, uh, whatever you know, you try to, do, to detect? Or are you considering that optical is still the way to go? There is this issue with label-free uh, or uh, label-free uh, sensing. Or what, what is your view of that in terms of a, a commercial uh, applications? We have uh, designed this platform as open platform and that's also in the respect of the detection technology. Optical detection is contact free, that's obvious one benefit, but you need to bring light in, light out, what is not always the easiest way to go. We have an electrochemical detection system for a 64 multiplexing, what's not too bad. Um, and we are working with colorimetric detection and also fancy and research and obviously Rama technology is up, up to, at the moment on vogue um, some surface uh, or uh, waveguide solutions uh, on research level we are doing a lot of things uh, but mainly for uh, direct application that's electrochemistry, colorimetry and fluorescence detection and microscopy. Thank you. Okay, please introduce yourself first. Post the question from the general members. Then, from thank you very much. My name is Bazar from Barcelona, uh, Brazil, and also I am the research center for the country. Okay, thank you. And Oh, yeah. uh, okay. My question to Dr. Claudia uh, and this, uh, to patient. I hope this uh, question can be uh, sure. Uh, should be uh, once uh, question one is about uh, do you have any benchmark or comparison result of your product with another gold standard of your product or even uh, your competitor? Uh, about uh, your work and something. And <laughs> the second one is uh, if uh, somebody or even a company in Indonesia to uh, try to purchase of your product, how much uh, the price of your product? Thank you, this. Okay. Um, the first question was in respect to benchmark the, the system to the performance of existing systems. We do the benchmark, first of all, on modular level. That means compare, for instance, sample preparation with a prior gene gold standard for RNA extraction, the other gold standard for DNA extraction. Um, we are faster for and at least um, comparable in the results. So that's a good, good thing. Um, and then the, the other part, PCR. Uh, sensitivity uh, is always comparable because otherwise it would not be acceptable. Time is usually half um, and that ends up um, with the normal overall system. You have one and a half hour analysis time and we get at least quickly to the hour and then go down in the analysis time. So that's from benchmark. Cost is obviously uh, next to the performance, the, the, the other main criteria. Um, cost range from the, uh, you, you will, uh, let me say in advance, you will never end up with a microfluidic device at comparable cost to a lateral flow strip. So that's a no-go. That means when you apply uh, microfluidics, you need make to use, uh, you, you, you need to use the advantage that means include sample preparation. Uh, preparation and creation storage. When you are talking, and I'm, I'm simply 
can talk about what we did for the Gates Foundation. All other customers are confidential and uh, I'm not allowed to talk about, but there we made this example and also presented this to the World Health Organization and all these um, yeah, involved uh, actors there. Um, you end up with something in the range of $2.80 for the easiest part, that means clinical chemistry up to around about 7 to $8 for the molecular assays when you are in double digit millions. So that's uh, when you go down and just have a thousand cartridges, it's expensive, unless you make a common effort, and that's what we're doing in particular for our smaller clients. Um, use the same setup, standardize as much as possible that we can fabricate uh, SA1 for customer one with the same equipment as SA2 for customer two. Um, otherwise, uh, an economy of scale is not possible. So, important message, the complexity of the cartridge is one part, not the microstructure, but build what you build in as reagents and other devices, sample preparation, and mainly the, the quantity. If, as I said, if you just look at one small quantity, you will not end up in an interesting price. Tangerang 
they all use it and there is a good uh, the evaluation feedback is good for use this uh, propolis fluoride and then uh, for the wound healing there is wound healing is like uh, for the mucosa wound there is uh, if the patient not allergic there is safety but in this uh, in my case this is for dentinal caries that is dentin there is not pulp not pulp caries if pulp caries there is a, a nerve there is nerve and blood and we can not use this uh, propolis fluoride in the pulp caries and we we only use for the enamel or dentin dentin caries and we can stop the process of dental caries in dentin layer or in uh, enamel layer this stop is depend on oral hygiene if the if the patient have good oral hygiene and then the propolis fluoride will uh, long term can be more than three months and uh, the process will be stopped until more than three months but if the patient have uh, bad oral hygiene poor oral hygiene not until one month the process caries will be active again that's uh, that's okay my answer i just want to uh, extend the question about about the, the the time of using this is there any degradation problem because it is a nature of uh, natural yeah, products just, uh, i answer it oh, yeah. i just answer it and then, uh, if the like uh, this is i compare with silver diamine chloride uh, the same as a uh, work uh, of silver diamine chloride and propolis chloride in dentinal cavity uh, dentinal caries uh, like uh, silver diamine chloride uh, the antibiotic uh, what's that? Uh, the antibiotic uh, antibacterial of silver diamine fluoride is more than strong than propolis fluoride and then silver diamine fluoride will longer stay in dentinal cavity uh, can be more than six months but propolis fluoride until our research only uh, until three months that's depend on oral hygiene Uh, the organizer said there's only two minutes left, so I'm, I'm going to ask. Uh, is, is there any question? Oh, okay. From, just one question. Okay. Can you stand up? Okay. Yeah. My name is Isa from Chemical Park, Engineering Park, Universal Association. Uh, I have some. I have a question to Miss Goldman. Uh, I think uh, I saw the chip outside, and I saw that it is made from glass, and it is very thin. How do you address the chip's uh, fragility so it may be viable to be used in maybe in some uh, emergency emergency medical situation in war zones that uh, that need that, that uh, have the need to be sturdy and uh, very uh, have some, uh, you know, uh, rough condition of there. Thank you. Uh, do you mean that? Yeah. How, how do you address the the, 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 the chip uh, fragility to be transported? Uh, uh, you 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 mean the ro robustness of the the chip in in transport yes, and yes, storage? Yes. 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 How uh, do you address that? Um, yeah, that's uh, addressed. Obviously, you, you have a system consisting of several elements, and we need to protect some of them. That's normal procedure um, in, in all this diagnostic field that at least uh, a plastic part is involved. The microtiter plate, the uh, standard assay is nothing else. What we have to handle uh, or have to bring further care inside is when we have liquid reagent storage, 
then we work with protectors, um, then you, you have a coverlet on top or a, a special protective layer to prevent that during transport we already empty our liquid reagents. So that is, is obviously a must, otherwise we damage our part prior use. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to conclude this uh, first session, uh, this plenary session, uh, that these two kinds, uh, this uh, presentation today, this morning, uh, the, are, the, are the examples of our uh, cooperation, of our research uh, cooperation uh, from the RCBE, from the Research Center for Biomedical Engineering. We are now developing uh, a prototype for uh, diagnostic, especially for sure about this, but uh, we are developing a, 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 a diagnostic uh, uh, tool uh, together with uh, ship shop and also this uh, propolis provide is uh, an example of uh, re cooperation, recent cooperation uh, from the from the faculty of engineering and also from the uh, dentistry uh, faculty. So. Uh, Please give a uh, warm applause again to the, those uh, two speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you Ladies and gentlemen, please remain on the stage. We would like to ask uh, your help in presenting the token of appreciation to both our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll begin the second session of the plenary speech of the International Symposium of Biomedical Engineering 2018. Before we begin the second plenary speech, we kindly remind and request all participants to have their mobile phones switched to silent mode. The second plenary session will feature speeches from Professor Theodorus and Arvan Nintis from the University of Warwick, United Kingdom, and Professor Kazuhiko Endo from Health Sciences, University of Hokkaido, Japan. The second session will be moderated by Dr. Dr. Gigi Deki Josiana Indrani, MDSC, from the Faculty of Dentistry, Universitas Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Deki is a senior lecturer in the Department of Dental Material Science in the Faculty of Dentistry, Universitas Indonesia since 1986. She completed her bachelor degree from Uti in 1984 and was awarded a master's degree in dental science from the University of Melbourne in 1994 and her doctoral education in material science was completed in 2012. Dr. Deki is also an active speaker in a number of seminars and conferences. Dr. Deki, the session is yours.
this second session, uh, I may want to ask uh, Professor Casuelindo uh, to talk first and then continued by Professor Tenuris because of the topic. It's a link between the first and the second uh, talk. Therefore, uh, Professor Tenuris, you, know, you can have 30 minutes from the time. Uh, 
biological response against degradation products uh, mainly uh, in categorized into two pathways. Uh, there are uh, non-specific immunological reactions against real devils. And the other is uh, metal ions released due to corrosion. This is a uh, specific uh, metal ion produced the allergic reaction. And this is a typical allergic disease caused by metal corrosion. Uh, in some patients, uh, allergic symptoms appear in uh, oral mucosa like this or an adjacent near to the corroded uh, metal restriction. Uh, skin allergic irritation also appear in some patients uh, when the metal ions are carried through the blood stream to the skin surface of fingers and foot like this. So this slide shows the pathogenic mechanism mechanism of metal allergy. Metal allergy reaction is classified as delayed type, say mediated immune reaction. Metal ion with low molecular weight cannot be act as an antigen. However, when metal ion is combined with carrier protein, it can be an antigen. This is the first step for the reaction and uh, followed by a series of immunological reactions like this for the occurrence of allergic uh, symptoms. For the diag diagnosis and treatment of the patient with metal allergic symptoms, First of all, we have to identify the metal restoration and the processes which cause uh, the allergy. Patch testing is the effective means to, <coughs> to know the sensitizing element. And we also know the composition of metallic restoration uh, using non-destructive method. According to this, True test results. If the patient is found to have a metal which is positive to skin reaction, uh, they should be retrieved from the oral cavity. After follow up of the patient, uh, if the allergic symptom would, would be removed, would be improved, the patient is treated with the material without containing element which cause allergic reactions. Uh, in a typical patch test protocol, the aqueous dilute solution of metal salt was placed onto the skin uh, with use of the adhesive cluster like this for 48 hours. And then subsequent assessment of the skin reaction is done. And after two days, three days, and seven days. In this case, this patient showed the strong positive skin reaction to mercury. Mercury and uh, positive skin reaction to cobalt, chromium, and uh, nickel. Uh, this is a sampling method to collect the small amount of sample from the uh, metallic distillation and process it in the oral cavity. So just to polish the metallic distillation surface by this disc, we can uh, sample uh, extremely small amount of metal powder on this disc, which is usually used the polishing the resin. So we can also employ the silicone point uh, when we sample the small amount of metal powder from inlay and amalgam fillings. 
Uh, these metal samples on this end point are subject to elemental analysis using the X-ray fluorescent spectrometer. The measurement is uh, completed usually Two, within two minutes. This is a spectra from the silver alloy plate and the silver alloy particle sampled on this of silver and palladium are high compared with the metal plate. But it's okay, we can identify the kind of metal and it, it is for the diagnosis. So I'd like to introduce the two critical cases. Uh, one is 52 years old male patient who had diagnosed as uh, arboplantar astrosis. astrosis. So he had a skin reaction, skin irritation here. And patch test results showed the strong positive reaction to the mercury. We analyzed all the distribution in, in the oral mouse and find that this patient had an amalgam feeling in the maxillary right second molar. So after removing this amalgam feeling for three months, the allergic symptom state was uh, largely improved. So this is a uh, second case. Uh, this is a uh, 40, 54 years old female patient. She had an, a skin irritation uh, on her fingers and sort of hood. Uh, she had many uh, metallic distillations in the oral mouth, oral cavity. And here, uh, this is a porcelain fluid to metal prong. These are porcelain fluid to metal prongs. So she had a positive skin reaction to a nickel. We analyzed the old diabetic distribution and found that uh, this uh, porcelain fluid to metal prong was made of nickel chromium alloy. So after removing the porcelain fluid to metal prongs for one year, the allergic symptom state was drastically improved, improved like this. So. I introduced you a two critical cases. Uh, allergy causing metal in the first case was mercury, and second case was nickel. These two metals are well known uh, contact sensitizing metals in Japan and also in Europe. a patient with allergic tendencies. So how can use, what kind of materials can we use for this patient? One is use of titanium for metallic materials. Corrosion resistance of titanium is extremely high as compared with a stainless steel, cobalt chromium alloy, and nickel chromium alloy. And uh, this is a Sorry, this is an NI, not NI, N, nitrogen, high nitrogen bearing stainless steel. Uh, we can develop the nickel free material, stainless steel, and cobalt chromium alloys. And uh, if we can also increase the corrosion resistance by surface treatment of nickel containing alloys. If we can increase the corrosion resistance, the amount of nickel released into the body is reduced. So this is very important. And now, uh, 
Catacomb is the latest to be drastically improved. So we can also use the high string ceramics. And this is, uh, these ceramics is very, are very stable, uh, much more stable than uh, metals. So it is safe for human body. But fracture resistance is uh, much less than uh, metals. So that's all. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Endo. Audience Professor Endo is a professor and chairman at the Department of Biomaterials and Engineering Division, School of Dentistry and Sciences at University of Hokkaido. He is also director of the Japanese Society for Dental Products, as well as director of the Japanese Society of Dental Materials and Devices. He, re is, he received his PhD in oral medicine in 1997 from Tokyo Medical and Dental University and also in engineering from the Yokohama National University. His recent interest span in the areas of dental products, material, and devices. So what have uh, Professor Endo talk about is about the degradation of metallic restoration and prosthesis, and also its biologic side effects. Uh, I think you should have uh, some questions about the talk. Oh, yes, uh, Professor Misri. So, because my background is in chemical engineering, so my question may be related to, to chemistry a little bit. About the corrosion itself, the metal corrosion itself. Uh, is this due to the acidic condition of the mouth itself? Uh, but uh, if it is true that you also mentioned that there are some some there is a delay uh, allergic is this caused by mouth and then I'm not, I'm not very sure what this is or is it the condition of the corrosion in the in the dead uh, the dermat, dermats here in the head I'm not very sure what this thank you for the question so first question uh, body fluid contains uh, chloride ions. So chloride ions uh, is the uh, chemical species which increase the corrosion of a uh, passive metal, such as not noble metal, uh, less noble metal, base metal, uh, such as stainless steel, cobalt uh, chromium alloy, and nickel chromium alloy. So, Usually in the human body, uh, if the corrosion resistance of that alloy, these alloys are low, the corrosion takes place. And if the corrosion resistance is high, but some uh, metal ions are released from the <coughs> materials into the human body. So second question, uh, if the small amount of metal ion released into the oral mass. Yeah. So oral mucosa permeability of oral mucosa is very high compared with other skin. So uh, oral mucosa uptake the metal ions and uh, these metal ions are transferred, carried through the bloodstream and uh, any transport to the, any part of the body. Thank you. Probably other participants want to ask about the song? Yes, uh, Dr. Anki. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Endo. Thank you for the presentation. Actually, nowadays in my uh, laboratory, we also we research about the side effect 
of this protection from this alloy. I'm from that history. And mostly from the students from the forensic studies. They also uh, nowadays uh, try to see the harmful of this alloy protest. And also there's uh, the finding is also kind of disturbing though because we are in the dentistry, we use a lot of this material as you know. So we try to find the how to detect uh, if there's any toxicity in the, in the body. Do you have any experience of uh, this kind of research or what do you think about this? Thank you. Uh, this, um, is asking that uh, a team in forensic forensic team found that there are a lot of metal toxicity in body. And how would uh, how would you probably explain how to know whether there is a toxicity in human? Uh, other than metal allergy, we have never experienced such a severe side effect against metals. So the use of metal it's so limited, and after a series of a lot of uh, preliminary test examination, animal test, uh, cell culture study, animal test, and uh, how can I say clinical studies. So other than a metal allergy, uh, I, I don't know any. Uh, Severe uh, side effect of the dog. Uh, sorry, Sensei. It's not severe, but uh, gradually. Uh, so it's genetically uh, involved.
Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a slight change of scenery. So actually, we're going to be broader. We're going to talk about how uh, we see holistically problems of multimorbidity, of complex diseases. And indeed, at the Institute of Healthcare at WU General University of Warwick, we work from materials to devising sensors, to taking off the shelf devices, up to building infrastructure that allows us to understand how information can help and improve healthcare and well-being. And this is going to be the journey I'm going to uh, follow today on a specific big burden. And actually, I'm going to uh, take the point that uh, your distinguished delegate from the health ministry made this morning that we have still some very interesting burdens and global health challenges. Well, we in the West, where we have dealt with all the infectious diseases, but still we have uh, 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 infectious diseases are across the world. And although this is the unfinished agenda, even in the West, child and maternal death is a big problem. Now, things are changing. And uh, your health ministry has recognized that indeed, and especially in the Western world, and as we are prospering in society, we tend to have a shift on the global disease burden for non communicable diseases, for chronic diseases. And this is the emerging agenda for the healthcare uh, uh, sphere. So uh, this is what the Commission of Investing in Health identified as the two remaining global challenges in terms of disease, but another challenge is the agenda that relates to the cost of how we manage healthcare. This is something we see everywhere, not only uh, here in Indonesia, but all over the world. Um, medical expenses and also productivity tend to be an issue. So for my uh, talk. I would like to talk about the problem of chronic diseases and the context in the context of multimorbidity. Let me give you a little bit uh, about this context. Actually, if we look at Europe uh, as a whole, over one third of the population and, uh, are, are, are having chronic diseases. Uh, this is like diabetes. Uh, heart failure, cardiovascular diseases, and associated problems like renal failure, depression, um, uh, 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 etc. And this, of course, is the main reason for our poor health and restricted activity. And actually, if you look at this in terms of economics, 70% of the healthcare expenditure is on non communicable chronic diseases. Of course, as we grow older and as we have managed to improve our lifespan, this has caused also the problem of accumulating uh, more than one condition. So these days we talk about chronic diseases, but we talk about multiple chronic diseases known as multimorbidity. So if somebody is a patient with diabetes, it is more likely that would have an associated issue maybe with heart uh, related to vascular related problems, renal problems, uh, depression, etc. So uh, I think this problem of mobility includes a variety of functional impairments and also cognitive impairments. And if you think about the older people, 65 plus, more than half of these people tend to have at least three chronic conditions, uh, statistically. And a significant proportion these days are more than So that's a very, very big burden. So the big challenge is how does the healthcare system and how do, does the healthcare enterprise overall deal with this problem? problem. And we, as biomedical engineers, I have trained as a biomedical engineer, I'm a medical scientist before that, uh, uh, we developed the technology 
for that. But uh, beyond that, we need to look at the overall healthcare enterprise. And uh, we find that it is really complex and time consuming to uh, look at these multiple diseases. Furthermore, we tend to be uh, organizing our healthcare system within our uh, society, within our citizenship. So, social care services enable patients to perform everyday activities, enable patients to monitor their activities, and this is very, very important. However, there is a further burden in Europe, but in the rest of the world. In some countries, social care services are very restricted because of budgets uh, uh, and because of organizational issues of uh, the way the population is spread out. Look at Indonesia, you have uh, a very large population spread out in a variety of patterns, a lot of urban areas, but also rural areas, which you might find similar to Sweden, uh, for example, which is a similar type of uh, spread out population. So social care services have a big role to play there, but they have a very big burden. And one of the problem and shortcomings is that healthcare services and social care services tend not to work with each other, tend to be silent. So I think this causes further and further problems in the management of chronic diseases. And of course, as I said, the financial burden to deliver this complex care is uh, a high demand to, to society, to government, to national uh, services wherever this is the case, or private insurance services uh, in this type of uh, healthcare approach. But we need to transform care delivery. This is our view in Europe. So, in Europe, at the moment, probably uh, my computer doesn't work, but at the moment, we tend to deal with chronic diseases mainly at the hospital, at acute care. Now, this increases the expenditure. So if you see, see this from the point of view of public health and, and, uh, and management, this is a big burden. Also, we tend to have a high proportion of primary care based uh, work. And um, so what we have been trying to do is increase the primary care uh, dealing of chronic disease. Uh, and in 2015, we wanted to improve that, reduce the hospital, but still the same more or less. And in the future, we want to make sure that citizens who are patients at the point in their life tend to manage their care themselves and we can do things at the community and at home as much as we can. This is our vision for 2020. We are 2018, and I can tell you we're still more or less as we were in 2015. So, still a big challenge. So, the other challenge for the community is that you have diversity and complexity in the way you manage uh, patients. So, this is uh, a, a quick example of how uh, a patient would be dealt by different healthcare professionals in four different scenarios. So, if you look at a stable patient out of hospital care or an unstable patient out of hospital care or a patient in hospital care or a patient at the point of discharge. There are different professionals like GP practitioners, nurses, social workers, carers, informal carers, like family members, uh, or other hospital specialists, pharmacists, etc., that need to interact. They need to do quite a lot of jobs and these job, jobs relate to a lot of complex communications. So this shows that it's not simply giving a simple drug to one of the disease, we have to deal with complex processes. And this is what uh, we try to do in uh, what we call integrated care. And this is a good view, and I think we will discuss it in the public health sessions, uh, where we try to apply universally care services for people in complex needs. In effect, 
with the greatest care is the management and delivery of health services so that citizens receive a continuum of preventative and curative services, prevention, therapy, and performances uh, following the therapy. And what we advocate in, in the Institute and in the project I'm going to show you is to use digitally enabled approaches, use information communication technologies in the provision of, of uh, integrated care. And this will help us to look into this problem. Now, why digital? There are different reasons why we are moving to a digital world in healthcare. Of course, the rest of the world is very digital. We all have smartphones, we are always on, on, uh, online, we are communicating. Uh, our homes depend on the internet. Uh, my home is a smart home. I have I switch on and off the lights from my mobile phone, so when my mobile phone is not charged, everything is dark, is, uh, so I need to ask my doctor to do the same, and, and so on and so on. But in healthcare, we have seen that digital technology goes beyond the desk of a doctor, which was the morning. Morning. electronic healthcare records. Now, we have linked records, and I think this is an effort countries to have a common electronic patient record across for the delivery of care. Not only we have the records for delivery of care, but we harvest the data, we use it for research. And a lot of the research that uh, we have here, heard this morning is also supported by information that tells us about the performance of, for example, specific sensors, of specific treatments, etc. And this helps us to do real time public decision making. Of course, we can use computers to do the concept of decision support. So, we can allow computers to help us make decisions, complex decisions, and of course, maximize the effectiveness of the delivery of health. And of course, with that, we improve patient safety. Now, with all these amazing sensor devices that most of you develop either for diagnostics or for management or for monitoring, we can deliver remote healthcare. And that's quite important, especially with wearable and implantable devices, we can have ways, new ways of capturing and monitoring physiological parameters and this is what we do as biomedical engineers. And finally, I think by changing all this approach, we can have new ways, new models of achieving healthcare uh, through, let's say, online consultations, digital interventions, etc. So, this is really why digital. And the opportunities and the challenges are the same. Of course, we have to take data and devices to integrate and interoperate, something that you see basic microfluidic devices to complex information systems in hospitals. Of course, the quality of the data and the evidence that we collect from all our sources of information in healthcare is of paramount importance. We need to make the citizens responsible for their health. So the model that the doctor knows everything or is like the magician of the tribe who knows everything has to stop. Citizens have to take responsibility. Chronic diseases are complex. Without participation of the empowerment of citizens, we cannot solve this problem. And of course, if we use the digital, then people have more choices, they have a community, they can help each other. Professionals, formal and informal care as well patients. And this makes everything more cost effective and the patient experience through distance with more telecare services can be more exciting. So, this is the project I am, uh, uh, would like to present as an example of dealing with the complexity of course, liquidity and using a cloud approach, so uh, information communication technology, based on the needs of the healthcare sector to help 
professionals, healthcare professionals, and patients to collaborate in the way they create and they execute personalized care plans for chronic conditions. So what we are doing is we are trying to use our knowledge, our evidence, uh, in the form of evidence guidelines, clinical guidelines, plus information that comes from sensors, from electronic health care records, from information that the patient volunteers to the system, from their lifestyle, etc., in order to be able to make a decision which is the best plan for care for these multi-public patients. And uh, of course we do that use of information within the digital world, so we use computer systems, computer assisted decision support that allow us to do everything we do in the healthcare system. So risk prediction, stratification, which is the best route to take. You, have, you are a patient with diabetes, but also you have personalized variations from another person with diabetes. Uh, the problem of body pharmacy, usually when we have these multi-communities, you have to take chemical uh, uh, inputs uh, that might have adverse effects to each other. So that's a, 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 an interesting problem to deal with. And of course, to set individual goals to be able to improve the self-management and in some cases, reverse the course of the disease. Now, in the past, we used to say that patients with diabetes marry the disease for their life. But we have proven that both with appropriate medical uh, treatment and with lifestyle changes, we have cases of total reversal. So that's an amazing thing we see now. And as the evidence grows, we'll see what's happening in the future. Of course, this is, as I said, done by taking all this model, modality data that we collect from sensors, from providers, and we fuse it. And then we make, make it useful. So it's not only simple numbers, but they have a meaning. So we do this model for semantic functions through particular services like terminologies. And these allow, allow us to do meaningful analysis of the data. So, uh, think about particular microfluidic sensors that might collect glucose measurements, blood measurements in the case of diabetes, then take you to a record being semantically annotated as particular measurements at a particular time and then used for the treatment or the management actually of individual patients. And of course, the active involvement of patients is essential in this case. So, uh, as you will see, uh, this is what we try to do. To demonstrate the feasibility of our concept, which I will show architecture in a minute, we are focusing in our project on diabetes, heart failure, renal failure, and depression in different combinations in three large regions in Europe. And you will see in a moment why we chose these regions. Okay, this is the consortium, but most importantly, and, and actually it's an interesting project because this is. Uh, an, an effort where we put quite a lot of industry, so uh, we have large, medium, small, medium enterprises from uh, European companies like Cambio, is a large company that builds a lot of European electronic healthcare records, and smaller companies like Medicine that builds uh, uh, patient support tools. Uh, very few academic institutions, only actually two, uh, three institutions work in some normal and the rest are public bodies and we work with three large regions. One is the Sweden, it looks in it's a small world similarity between urban and rural areas. So we're working with someone there very close to Santa Claus uh, uh, County uh, in the region Yamland and um, uh, there we are looking how, pe how people are treated in cities and in areas where the, the closest uh, center is about 70 kilometers away. And actually the closest specialist center is 700 kilometers away. So 
as this remark here, the scenario here probably in some areas in Indonesia and some of your islands. Uh, if you look at the Boreksha region, which has a high density of population, but it has a lot of villages, so rural areas and small towns. And then we look at the Basque country, which is very concentrated in the city approach. So that's why we chose these regions to just regulate this, these problems. Uh, and here's the overall architecture. Let me take you through this uh, in the next three slides to explain what we're trying to do. So we tried to help these two groups of people, the multidisciplinary care team, specialists, nurses, doctors, students, nutritionists, uh, geriatricians, but why not be at the same hospital? They might be across different centers and make them work with their patients and inform carers in an inter uh, uh, in an interaction that allows them to collaborate to build personalized care plans for chronic disease management. So we develop three platforms, one that allows the entity with the choices of the patients to develop personalized care plans, a platform that allows us to embed this into the healthcare system and execute the plans and be informed uh, uh, by the information we regularly collect from these patients, from devices, from sensors, from electronic health characters, and a platform that allows the uh, uh, patients to be uh, empowered by making specific decisions. And the data, as I said, is to interoperate both in terms of technical and semantic interoperability and of course within the privacy and information governance uh, rules. And it's collected from a variety of sources, from the traditional record that exists in a hospital or a general center, from social care systems, from things, uh, uh, from systems and unmanned devices in home and community care systems, and from the patients themselves, including wearable personalized devices and telemonitoring systems. And we use all this to be able to, to do the middle part, which is fuse the data, create the plan, and make specific decision support that relates to the whole world. So we still have one minute more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to the whole management of the disease. So that's what we, we, we try to do. That's an example of how the personalized care plan is uh, created from a point of view of how the doctor sees it and how uh, uh, the patient sees it. And all of this is supported by the clinical decision support system. And this is an example of how, for example, when you have diabetes and renal failure, you use the technology that takes all that information, crunches it in a particular way in our platform to be able to take the guideline from two single diseases to create a guideline for multiple diseases, in this case, a reconciled guideline. So, in summary, to close my memory talk, this is what we try to do in C3 Cloud. And we try to create a digital environment for integrated care where we help the professionals, the patients and their healthcare givers. We develop new clinical guidance that is digitally enhanced. We have to give self-management tools to individuals. And of course, we integrate our information systems across the healthcare and we optimize our models in terms of integration. So I think, I believe that digital enabled integrated care is the way forward. And digital technology has shown the strength, uh, its strength for transforming the healthcare. Benefits to individuals and society are multiple. Most importantly, we understand how we can improve the lifestyle, we can prevent death, and of course, we can, in the case of do better business management. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Teotihuacan. I'm quite positive about this idea of C3 Cloud. Uh, but my question is, is there any obstacles or barriers from the insurance companies? Because uh, it's, for, for me, it looks like uh, we are giving in some uh, responsibilities uh, of the healthcare to more uh, to more the, to the society who is, who is in a multi-level uh, knowledge uh, awareness of the knowledge and also the the skills of the administration. So I, I, the particular model we are looking is a mixed model. So we have private insurance. Uh, companies as part of our model, especially in Sweden, but it is mainly public national insurance. So we don't see barriers there. And if you think about it in the future, these tools could be also nicely uh, remunerated by uh, insurance companies. So this particular information makes exact the type of reimbursement insurance companies will have. But I don't see the problem there. And the main barrier at the moment is how do we deal with that information and how we make that information secure. So the governance of that information is the main barrier. In Europe, we are very protective of our patient information. Maybe because we are afraid that insurance companies will charge us a lot. So I think this is where the worry is about and the barrier will be in the future. But if these technologies exist, the way we work with insurance companies has to still keep confidential particular type of information so that insurance companies do not overcharge patients and, and citizens. Anyone? Yes. Mr. Thank you very much, Dr. I'm interested in the to digital, digital handcap, and uh, but in part of digital handcap, I'm working on a patient monitoring system, patient monitoring system in, in uh, for the home based monitoring system. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, platform or technology that can be adopted from this point. Uh, what is uh, your recommendation for the in the future? Uh, if the, of this healthcare. So it's kind of the, uh, the promising technologies. Uh, I'm working in wireless technology to be more for uh, patient monitoring system. So what kind of a wireless technology that can be used to be promising? Uh, maybe you can Thank you. So if I just correct your question, one of my recommendations for future use of technologies. So I think the work we are doing is biomedical engineers. So, uh, if we take the examples that Claudia showed, so devices that allow us to do diagnostics uh, 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 basically on, on particular microfluidic uh, 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 solutions or continuing monitoring, uh, uh, these are useful devices for the type of data we take. The important thing is we try to standardize not so much the technology but the way we interface with technology. I think that's an important point that we need to bear in mind. And uh, the interesting thing is to try to understand how this multimodal data information can be fused. So the way that in the future maybe some of these devices might need to be developed in their interfaces needs to take into account the way the information will be extracted and will be usually uh, uh, integrated with other things. So I, 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 I think most of the things you I look at the abstract book and the program and most of the things that you're discussing in this uh, conference are the future of what you will see in sensing devices, in environmental devices, in information systems and in public health needs that we need to integrate. The important thing is we need to start talking to each other. Uh, so, for example, in my 
Martin, uh, Dr. Jean Charmet, although he's an expert in microfluidics and he builds his devices, he talks to the informatics uh, people who are groups of, that we understand what kind of data we take out of his devices, what kind of measurements, and then how we use his measurements in the context of a particular problem. So that's really uh, my recommendation. Understanding the interfaces and talking to each other as engineers and, and scientists. Any questions? Yes. you about what is contribution of AI or artificial intelligence for the future digital healthcare and what's the limit of uh, we can use AI for the future because I think AI is the promising, a promising future. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for your question because it's very topical and very uh, hot at the moment in UK. Actually, our government is giving millions of pounds. Uh, actually, the total investment is a couple of billions of pounds for AI and healthcare solutions. And it has been a hype about AI. Uh, but we need to take it in a positive way. So, uh, part of the solution I showed you has a form of AI, it has some simple machine learning, some simple pattern processing approaches that allow us to do clever reconciliation and clinical decision support. So we take the data and on the basis of particular patterns we make some clinical decisions. So that's a very uh, simple but very effective rule-based approach to AI. Now we have seen amazing developments in AI, especially in self-learning systems. We have seen them also in terms of materials, but in terms of materials, and that's something we need to harness better. So, for example, at the moment, AI is very hot into looking at healthcare records, extracting interesting patterns, doing interesting correlations, looking at things that we might have discovered before. And in areas of basic life sciences, we have seen the use of AI in bioinformatics, the discovery of new interactions, let's say. Or uh, etc. So, so I think uh, the sky is the limit uh, for this. But we need to take this in a sensible way so that we don't scare the public because people think, oh, machines are going to take over, uh, they're going to learn themselves, and we're not going to have control. Actually, we build these machines, we build the algorithms, we build the approach to AI. So, uh, I think uh, the public perception might be different, the engineering perception is let's take what we have developed for since the 1960s. Okay, AI started around that and very, very slowly developed two techniques which are very powerful because we have powerful computers these days. So, I see this as an area of development, especially in understanding the meaning and helping professionals to, to make better decisions, but also helping to do the mundane things. So think of a radiology department. Too many x-rays to read for a radiologist. A system that would triage the x-rays as important, medium important, less important. The radiologist could concentrate on difficult cases and others could be achieved, achieved diagnosis by machine. So that's an example of the practicality of this video. Thank you very much for all the good